And then we're connected again. So it's Ranger Russ at the Meg's Point Nature Center. I'm in a completely different room today. Normally I would be in the woods room or the water room. I'm in the air room today, which is really our entranceway. We're talking about a really special bird, but before we do that, we have to go over our reminders. First reminder is that you need to cover your face. If you're not able to keep social distance, whether you're out in the park or in a store, wherever you go, cover your face right up like this, okay? You also need to wash your hands really well. So use soap and water, warm soap and water. You need to cough into your elbow, completely cover your mouth if you have to cough or sneeze. We don't wanna spread our germs out. It's probably a good thing to do anyway, even if we didn't have a virus. Um, and we don't wanna to touch our face. So if you can do all of those things, we're gonna get through this a lot faster. I know people are getting really impatient. You wanna get outside, you wanna enjoy the fresh air and the beautiful parks. And today, maybe not so much. It's really raining here at Hammond Acid today. But all of these things will help us get through it. Now, the parks are open. When you go to a park, you've gotta follow the rules. We need to keep social distance. 20 mice, the length of 20 mice between you and anyone that's not in your family, that's the way we're gonna get through this a lot faster. That way the parks can stay open. Because if everybody is close together, we're closing the parks, okay? If we see that the parking lot is getting really full, if people are gathering together, clustered too much in one area, either that area is gonna be closed or the whole park will be closed. So please follow those rules. If a park is closed, don't visit it. And I know a lot of you are watching from all over the country, even some of you from around the world. Let's follow the rules wherever you're from. Follow those rules. If you see that an area is closed, find a different area. Here in Connecticut, our state parks are no more than 15 minutes from any person, which means if you, one park is full, you're only 10 or 15 minutes from another park. So go visit that one. And that way we can spread out. Also, we have state forests here in Connecticut and miles and miles, 300 some odd miles of blue trails. Go find a blue trail, go to a state forest, keep spread out, okay? As soon as the building's open, I hope you all come and visit the Nature Center. Uh, but until then, this is how you're gonna get to see the Nature Center. You ready to talk about my favorite animal of the day. I'm actually going to be talking about an animal that is not alive. This is a, a mount that we have here at the Nature Center. And these animals visit Connecticut not all the time. So I'm just gonna turn the camera around so that you can see the animal that we're talking about. So you can see it, boom. How cool is that? It's a snowy owl, okay? I'm gonna pan so you can see the whole snowy owl. So these will visit Connecticut. They come down usually in the winter and their visits are really dependent on lemmings. Way up north in the Arctic Circle, there are little lemmings and those lemmings, which I believe are a rodent, that's what snowy owls like to eat. When the lemming population drops, so the lemming population will go up and down depending on the year, just like anything in nature, it's gonna cycle, you're gonna get a curve. We've talked about leveling the curve with the, with the virus, the COVID-19 virus. The natural populations of animals are in that curve, it goes up and down. When the lemming population drops really low, the snowy owls come south. Some of them will stay in Connecticut, move around here in Connecticut. Some of them continue even further south. So that's how we end up seeing these birds throughout Connecticut. This year we had, I think, two sightings here at Hammonasset of snowy owls, which are really cool. He's starting to rock back and forth because the heater just turned on, so that moves him a little bit. Now this bird is located, as you walk into the nature center, it'll be right over your head. So hopefully you can all come and visit and see this snowy owl. 
I have to use this as an example because again, snowy owls are not common in Connecticut. They do not show up very often here. Now, when you look at a snowy owl, you're going to see, obviously, it's got this beautiful white color. This one has lots of stripes on its chest. Now, those stripes or bars on the chest, those are going to be dependent. The males are a lot darker. The males have a lot more stripes than the females. As they get older, they get whiter. Okay, so the, the stripes will fade. Uh, you can see here I'm competing with the parrots right now because they're not happy about me being over here. I had to put a ladder up so that I could get this view of the snowy owls, so they really don't like the ladder. So as they get older, the, the barding will go away, the stripe, striping will go away, and males are uh, darker than females, typically. So that is really cool. Look at those eyes. Now most people, as soon as you say owl, you think, okay, it's, it's nocturnal, it's active at night. These are primarily diurnal. And if you think about it, it really makes sense. They're up in the Arctic Circle, which does not get a lot of darkness in the summertime when they're primarily there. It's dark almost all winter, so they do spread out a little bit, come south in the winter. But during the summer, it's light. When they come in this, down to this area, they are diurnal. And the reason that they like Hamanasset, the area that they live in, the tundra up north, is large, flat, opened plains. Short, scrubby grasses, long, flat, prairie-like areas with lots of rodents moving around. Here at Hamanasset, we have open salt marsh, which resembles the prairie or the tundra where they're from. Lots of wide, flat, open area with short, uh, scrubby brush, grasses with lots of rodents, which is what these guys like to eat. So Hamanasset is a great place to find them. You can also find them in, in farmer's fields, open fields for the winter. Take a look at those talons. They can swoop down and grab their prey. Those talons are large. They, have, they are powerful. I believe that these, there's 500 PSI. So 500 pounds per square inch in the talon that it can use to capture its prey. And the parrots want to be on air today. They, they already had their turn. You guys had your turn on. They didn't like the camera in their... Uh, aviary, so they were really quiet when I was inside there with them. All right, so some other things I can tell you. If anyone has any questions, you can post them at any time. Also, I'd like to see where you're watching from, so if you want to post where you're sending me a message from, that would be really cool. These guys get a pretty good wingspan, about 59 inches would be a max wingspan for them. So it's not the largest of the owls in the world. It's, the, it's how long do they stay in Connecticut. They are really are only here a short time and go pretty quickly. Um, at, at the park here, we'll see them for a day or two and then they'll, they'll move on. Um, we do get, there was one year that we had sightings almost every day we were seeing them, but we were seeing them uh, they were different owls that we were seeing. So we'd see one for one or two, maybe three days, and then that would leave and another one would show up. That year was a great year. The lemming population was really, really low, almost no lemmings. So we were seeing these all the time. I'm going to turn this like this so we can get sort of an under view. Imagine if you were a rodent, a mouse, or a lemming, and that was coming down from above. Now they're silent flyers like most uh, other owls. The way their feathers fit together, it makes them very quiet while they're, while they're in flight. Their breeding season is May to September, but that happens up in the uh, tundra. So we're not going to see them nesting down in this area. Uh, some other things I can tell you about them. Uh, they usually have three 
to 11 young. That's the range of the young, but their average is going to be somewhere in the middle of that. Their lifespan is typically about nine years, so it's, it's a good lifespan for an owl. They don't live a really long time. Look at the tail. Look at the barding in the tail. You can see some stripes. There are more on the other side. The black talons really stand out on those white fluffy feet. So look at the feet. You can see how feathery the feet are. So the toes are completely covered with feathers. Not many owls have that. Most owls, the feet are bare. So this is going to be a signal that this owl is really active in cold weather. So they're really built for the colds. Those feathered feet help keep their feet cold in the extreme cold. Okay, now the blue jays and the parrots are going. So we're having a good bird, bird party over here right now. Do we have any other questions coming up? So it takes about 14 to 26 days for the young to fledge and about a month for them for the incubation period. So the, the females are going to be on or around the nest for a couple of months once they lay their eggs. There are some predators on them. So they're ground nesters. They're, they're more diurnal. So they really have to watch out. The primary predator is the Arctic fox up where they're from. Uh, and then there are some birds, some predatory birds that may take, typically they're going to be targeting the young out of the nest, not necessarily the adults. One owl can eat 1,600 lemmings in a year. So if you think about a lemming, it's larger than our mice, twice the size or a little more than a mouse, actually a little smaller than a squirrel. So we'll say between a, a chipmunk and a squirrel size is a lemming and 1,600 lemmings. So when the lemming population drops way down, that's why they have to spread out and find additional food sources. All right, do we have any other questions? A group from Maryland is saying hello. That's really cool. I think Maryland... You guys tune in a lot. Okay. Now this afternoon, it's a rainy day here at Hammond Asset, so I'm going to be doing an inside activity. And we'll, we'll be doing that at 2 o'clock. So come back to Facebook Live at 2 o'clock for an inside activity. I don't know if it's raining where all of you are, but it is raining here and it's supposed to get worse as the day goes on. And then overnight, we're expecting a lot of rain and wind here in Connecticut. So we'll be doing some inside programs for today. And tomorrow will be inside programs as well. But you can see our live programs on Facebook at 11 and 2 o'clock, Tuesdays through Fridays. You can see our archived videos on YouTube and our website, megspointnaturecenter.org. Please like us and follow us on Facebook and YouTube. That will tell our, your friends how much fun you're having watching these programs. I love to see the feedback, so you can continue to put up the comments even after the video uh, has been aired, and we will try and answer any questions that you might have after the program is aired. Take a look at the beak. It's hard to see the beak because of all the feathers around it. Again, those feathers are keeping the owl warm, but that's what it uses to, to cut its food. So the talons, that's like the fork for holding on to the food, and the beak, that's like the knife for cutting and eating the food. Are owl's ears asymmetrical? <laughs> Somebody's asking if owl's ears are asymmetrical, and you must know a lot about owls, because yes, they are. Uh, typically for owls, one side of the one ear hole, they don't have an external ear, they have a hole, one of them is higher and further back than the other. So not only are they not symmetrical uh, height-wise, but right to left, they're also not, front to back, they're also not symmetrical. So... 
So the coloring is the difference. The male snowies are barred with the dark brown. Um, when they're younger, as they get older, that will, will fade away. In the winter, they also they will change color in the winter. And the, the females will stay dark for their whole lives. I think I said that the females are lighter. The males get lighter, the females stay uh, striped. So yes, you can tell by the, the color and pattern. The question is, do they have more than one set of babies per season? Typically, no. And I'm going to remind everyone, there are exceptions in nature. There are exceptions to every rule. So what could possibly happen, what could cause them to have two clutches in one year is if one clutch were raided by predators early in the nesting season, they would immediately re-nest. So that's their survival method. I want to tell you another little thing about them. Uh, John James Audubon was a, a man who named many of the birds. He did lots of bird observations, paintings. So he gets lots of credit for what we know about birds. And at one point he observed a snowy owl sitting by a hole in the ice and it grabbed a fish as the fish came near the surface. So predators have a general target. There's, there's a prey item that a predator is going to eat primarily. But they're also smart. And if that prey item isn't available, then they're going to look for other things. So they might take, snowy owls will take birds. They might take a fish. They will target other things other than lemmings. So their main food source are lemmings, but there's an, always an opportunity to take something else. And they're not going to say, oh, that's not a lemming. I'm not going to eat it. If they see something they can eat, they're going to eat it. How did, how old was the owl when it died? Uh, good question. So this, we believe, was a young owl. This one was found in Connecticut, and it went to a rehabilitator. I believe that by the time it was transported to the rehabilitator, it had died. There are lots of things that could have caused its death. I don't think that they did a, a test on this one. But we find them with lead poisoning. We find them with rodenticides. Uh, there, so there are toxins that can poison them. Occasionally they get a virus or a disease on their own. So things like West Nile and uh, Eastern equine encephalitis could also kill them. So there are lots of things that it, that it could have been. It was not a trauma. So it didn't fly into a car or, or something along those lines. It was something that caused it to not be able to hunt on its own. It became emaciated, which means they, they're losing a lot of weight and get skinny. There's a good vocab word, ema emaciated. So if you go to the virtual learning center on megspointnaturecenter.org, you'll see a vocabulary list that we're adding to our videos. And I think that might be a good vocabulary word. But that's how we ended up with it. And we had a, an organization, the uh, Connecticut Shoreline Waterfowlers Association, offered to pay to have it mounted like this. Again, this is not something that's common in Connecticut. So it's a great opportunity for you to see what one looks like. And as impressive as this looks on video, I'm going to tell you it's far more impressive when you see it up close. You can see the fine feathers around the face. It's just a very, very awesome bird to have as an exhibit item. Okay, I want to remind everybody about our programs. So continue to tune in to Facebook Live. You can see these programs. We're adding new things onto our YouTube channel. So I'm filming and then putting up. We're going to be start out with interviews. We're also going to be adding uh, a nature type journal or a blog where People are contributing their thoughts about nature. I really love that. And if we don't have any other questions, I'm seeing what happened. I'm not sure what the happened. So again, we're not sure how this owl ended up dying. Um, it became emaciated, it lost uh, the ability to hunt, and what, by the time it was picked up, it didn't survive uh, the rehabilitation.
Actually, I don't even think it made it to the rehabilitators. There were two owls that year, and, and one of them made it to the rehabbers but died shortly after, and the other one, I believe, died on the way to the rehabilitator. So, so they go actually pretty far south. They go past New Jersey. So I f I've heard of them occasionally being in Delaware. I don't know that they go any further than Delaware, but New Jersey gets them a lot, a lot more than we do, because they migrate through, hang around in New Jersey for a while, and then head back up. So that's really pretty cool. All right, I want to do a shout out to the friends of Ham and Asset. They are providing the food for the animals, so our blue jays and parrots that you're hearing over there, time for them to talk. I'm going to show you them. There, there are the parrot. And there are the Blue Jays, and the friends of Ham and Asset have graciously been paying for the food uh, to keep the animals well cared for during our quarantine. So, tune in this afternoon at 2 o'clock. We'll do an inside program. It's going to be fun. And we will continue to do this as long as the Nature Center is closed. You can come and watch these shows. So thank you for tuning in, and we're going to say goodbye to our Blue Jays. See you all this afternoon.